Understanding where knowledge comes from has been a challenge for generations in the United States. Everybody has ignored the the impact and the, the help and you know the perspectives of Native peoples just so that we can write maybe a more nationalist story of of these heroes of the, of the American sort of West. And I would wish that we would um, decolonize all that stuff and try to figure out how to work together again like we used to. This 300-year-old ponderosa pine is one of Oregon's newest heritage trees. It stands in a mature grove in the Whispering Pine Horse Camp a place at the confluence of two important Native American trails, where people have camped and traded goods for thousands of years. In a broad sense, this tree is connected to the many ways in which people of Oregon have traveled over the Cascade Mountains, from ancient indigenous trade networks to the highways you and I travel on today. But we have forgotten to tell all of that history the tree still bears a scar from 166 years ago when a young Lieutenant Philip Sheridan carved his name into it. Sheridan, a member of Williamson's Pacific Railroad Survey, only spent a few days here. But past histories of this tree have been fixated on the mark Lieutenant Sheridan made on it. That's likely because Sheridan later became famous as a general in the Civil War. He also had a brutal record interacting with native people. But this tree has a much deeper significance than having Sheridan carve his name into it. The tree represents the actions of unnamed indigenous people and the process of history ignoring them. While we may know about the tree because of Sheridan and the expedition he was a part of, the tree stood tall here long before he carved his name into it. This tree connects to a time when English wasn't the dominant language, a time when many peoples and cultures actively stewarded the land around it. This is a story about proper credit for knowledge, of a nation fixated on expanding its own empire, and of a landscape most of us take for granted. I'm David Lewis. I am a associate professor of faculty at Oregon State University in Anthropology and Ethnic Studies. And I'm a member of the Grand Ronde Tribe with Sandy Am, Chinook, and Tekelma ancestry. We've been here probably for six, at least 16,000 years. We have stories, oral histories of tribes that talk about experiencing huge dramatic events like volcanoes, like things like the Missoula floods. You can read any, anything about tribes and their original cultures. They were constantly traveling back and forth between different peoples. And it, was, it wasn't just short distances, they were a lot of times hundreds of miles apart. And so places like the Cascades are riddled with trail systems. And Trial Hill early on figured out that if you just follow the ridge lines of, of mountain ranges, you can go somewhere pretty fast. Mike Boero, I'm the district archaeologist for the Sisters Ranger District of the Deschutes National Forest. So the, these trails that you see on, on the, the maps and the trails that they utilized were going north-south, east-west from this point for, for you know, an intricate trade network that existed for thousands of years um, for resources like uh, you know, obsidian to the Dalles and other major trading networks um, and going over west over the Cascades to the Willamette Valley. While a few European Americans had been in the region since the 1820s, the intricate landscape of the Cascades remained a mystery to U.S. officials. For the United States, the pursuit of a transcontinental railroad became an instrument to fulfill a mythical manifest destiny and squelch the claims of other tribes and nations. To that end, the United States led a series of railroad surveys in the 1850s. Lieutenant Robert S. Williamson and Lieutenant Henry L. Abbott's expedition passed through much of Oregon. Their expedition camped a few days here at Whispering Pine, 
which they called Camp 40. The survey parties were mostly military because the U.S. had to stake its claim on the West in the sort of a European way. You know, back then, oral histories of your claim didn't work. The expedition had ideas of empire and conquest at its core. Lieutenants George Crook and Philip Sheridan commanded a detachment of 100 troops. Civilian scientists, like Dr. J.S. Newberry, accompanied the military and furthered the American empire by cataloging various plants, animals, and landscapes they saw. With the power to name species and places, the expedition's detailed reports served not only as the basis for future roads and railroads, but as a source that would supplant indigenous names and knowledge and claim American scientific discovery. Typically, these expeditions relied on the navigation of local indigenous peoples, uh, not only for, for relations with tribes that they come across, but also navigating the complex system of, of trails that existed before these uh, Euro-Americans uh, explored the area. These parties absolutely employed native peoples. You had to have that because they knew the land. You know, they knew how to survive on the land. The expedition had a budget to pay individual native people for their insight and guidance. But with no obligation to credit these individuals, the U.S. both tacitly understood the power of indigenous knowledge and the ability to purchase it and appropriate it for its own ambition. The official report describes numerous times native peoples offered critical knowledge to the expedition. Most of the communication was in Chinook Wawa, a common trade language, which Williamson and Adlett quickly learned. They would pick up a language maybe like Chinook Wawa in about a month, but if they were immersed in it. And even if you didn't pick up the whole language, you could pick up at least enough to get by, enough words to sort of, you know, get lunch or trade something. By taking the time to learn the language, Williamson and Abbott were acknowledging the value of indigenous knowledge. It was very common that, that people in tribes had knowledge of numerous languages. People had to interact with their neighbors, and so that, that's one reason to have at least a, a grasp of more than one language, you know, your neighbor's language, your language. And so then there's this really interesting multilingualism that's sort of natural to the landscape. The expedition departed Fort Redding on July 28, 1855, often splitting into two separate parties to take scientific measurements. A month later, they had reached Klamath Lake, and a Klamath village hosted and fed them. Williamson and Abbott struggled with the language understand directions of what lie ahead. Returning to the trail, Williamson encountered a new group of native people who offered more directions that he could understand. Near present-day Lapine, Williamson decided to split from his main group. He took Sheridan and the citizen scientists to trace the upper Deschutes River clear past its headwaters, around Mount Bachelor, all the way to Green Lakes. Meanwhile, Abbott and the pack train followed the main stem of the Deschutes River to Tumalo Creek. September 1st, we resumed our march on the trail. We soon overtook two mounted Indians. They spoke a little Chinook and gave us to understand that the trail soon forked, one branch going to the Dalles, the other to the Willamette Valley. About nine miles from camp, we reached the forks. Lieutenant Robert Williamson, Official Report, 1855. The camp, which they called Camp 40, became a base where they would spend the next month surveying. Reuniting with Abbott for only a few days, Williamson split off to return to Camp 40. It was at Black Butte where he ordered Abbott to proceed north and survey all the way to Fort Dalles and then map a pass 
over Mount Hood and the upper Clackamas River. Lieutenant Williamson decided to travel on and encamp near the forks of the Indian Trail. We passed through an open forest for the whole distance and encamped on a little brook. From a slight eminence above the camp, the snowy peaks of the Three Sisters appeared quite near. A large meadow, which Lieutenant Williamson had previously seen and upon which he depended for grass, proved to be a cranberry swamp. A sufficiency of excellent bunch grass was found among the trees. Huckleberries, strawberries, and thimbleberries abound in the vicinity. Lieutenant Henry Abbott, Personal Diary, 1855. Camp 40's resources were so appealing that Williamson and his smaller detachment commanded by Sheridan spent considerable time investigating the multiple passes over mountains we now call the Three Sisters and Mount Washington. But the expedition was unaware that the lush resources that replenished them were not simply the product of an untouched wilderness. The, the idea of an, of an untouched land is a romanticized view of the world, as if native people were not here Native people have been, have been on every square inch of this place, and their effects are felt everywhere. This area right here was probably attractive because it was used by Native Americans, and it was also managed by Native Americans. I think that's an important point. That's credit that we don't give to indigenous people sometimes, is, is, is they were active managers of this landscape. And the sort of management tools that they would have used, specifically fire, would have been beneficial for this area and uh, the large ponderosa pines that you, you see here. They wanted the landscape to produce food and so they would, would set fire to the landscape, usually late summer, late September when the rain started to come. But fire itself does tend to stimulate the growth of a lot of uh, plants, eliminate pests and, and eliminate competitive species that are not fire resistant. And so we have then maybe 8,000 or more years of, of species that are chosen for fire uh, in a traditional landscape here. September 13th. This morning we followed the Indian Trail and crossed the divide of the Cascade Range. Many ridges and ravines render the route utterly impractical for a railroad. Lieutenant Robert Williamson, official report, 1855. The expedition waited out several days of furious and violent rains at Camp 40. And while we don't know for sure, it's very likely that this was the moment where Lieutenant Philip Henry Sheridan carved his name and the date into this tree. On the final days of rains, another party of native people arrived in the camp. They told us the trail we had followed only went a short distance. The only route in this vicinity to the Willamette Valley was by the wagon road south of Diamond Peak. Lieutenant Robert Williamson, Official Report, 1855. With this information, Williamson left Camp 40 and the resources he had depended on. Retracing his steps down the Deschutes River, he crossed the Cascades over the Middle Fork Willamette Pass and eventually went on to Fort Vancouver. Two years later, in 1857, they would finally publish their report. At critical points, the expedition's survival depended on native people who offered valuable information and guidance to bountiful camps like at Whispering Pine. Those individuals are, are rarely talked about in the historical record. So it's the native peoples, collectively, that knew all, this, all the information. But they don't really get the credit. U.S. officials hailed the scientific knowledge documented in the report as discoveries. Discovery is always a problematic term when you're talking about this stuff, because discover what, you know? Uh, a, land, a landscape in an area that had been managed by indigenous peoples for probably 10,000 years at least, time immemorial. The descriptions of flora, fauna, and geography by Dr. Newberry and others led to several species and place names referencing members of the expedition. But these names on the landscape obscure the reality 
that these men were just following directions obtained from indigenous people. They don't really give credit to the native people for knowing all this stuff. And the tribes are not adverse to getting paid for things. Uh, they didn't see the whole picture, you know, like we see nowadays, the whole colonization picture. All they saw was that small postal stamp of it at the time, but they were not adverse to getting paid for, you know, their skills. We never hear the native perspective, what they were going through, what, what they were experiencing because of this migration to the West, you know, or how much they helped. In the years to follow, railroads and highways would roughly trace the pathways of Williamson and Abbott's survey. Many of the highways over the Cascade Mountains today were influenced by the trails, knowledge, and expertise of unnamed indigenous people that made the report possible. If you want to visit the tree at Camp 40, it's now known as Whispering Pine Horse Camp. You'll notice that the tree has sealed over the scar Phil Sheridan and the Williamson Abbott expedition left on it. But as we have come to understand, the significance of this tree goes much deeper than Sheridan's scar. This story reveals that the success of the Williamson Abbott expedition was predicated on indigenous stewardship of a landscape, of pre-existing indigenous trails, and the intimate geographical knowledge of native people, many of which remain historically nameless and unjustly ignored. Indeed, the scars of history run deep, and the fact remains that native people shaped this land and its history. It's the responsibility of us all to remember that.